Welcome to Our Lady Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and together we're praying the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let's do that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And let's pause for a moment to consider our lives and to confess our sins. For the weakness of our faith, for the times of doubt and fear, Lord, have mercy. For the times we fail to proclaim to the world that we belong to Jesus, Christ, have mercy. For the good we mean to do but don't, all the sins of omission, Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks to your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father, amen. And so we pray. Let us pray that Christ may be our true light. Father, you call all of your children to walk as children of Jesus Christ. Free us from the darkness that keeps us from radiance in your divine truth. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. For he fashioned all things that they might have being, and the creatures of the world are wholesome. And there is not a destructive drug among them, nor any domain of the netherworld on earth, for justice is undying. For God formed man to be imperishable. The image of his own nature he made him. But by the envy of the devil, death entered the world, and they who belong to his company experience it. The word of the Lord. I will praise you, Lord, for you have rescued me. I will praise you, Lord, for you have rescued me. I will extol you, O Lord, for you drew me clear and did not let my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord, you brought me up from the netherworld. You preserved me from among those going down into the pit. I will praise you, O Lord, for you have rescued me. Sing praise to the Lord for his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger lasts but a moment, a lifetime his good of fill. At nightfall weeping enters in, but with the dawn of rejoicing. I will praise you, O Lord, for you have rescued me. Hear, O Lord, and have pity on me. O Lord, be my helper. You change my mourning into dancing. O Lord, my God, forever will I give you thanks. I will praise you, O Lord, for you have rescued me. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, as you excel in every respect, in faith, discourse, knowledge, all earnestness, and in the love we have for you, may you excel in this gracious act also. 
For you know the gracious act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Not that others should have relief while you are burdened, but that as a matter of equality, your abundance at this present time should supply their needs, so that their abundance may also supply your needs, that there may be equality. As it is written, whoever had much did not have more, and whoever had little did not have less. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ destroyed death and brought life to light through the gospel. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. My friends, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing him, he fell to his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please, come lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. And he went off with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There was a woman afflicted with a hemorrhage for 12 years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only seemed to grow worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately, her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to Jesus, You see, the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. And while he was speaking, people from the synagogue official's home arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid. You have to have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of the commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the house where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kuam which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The little girl, a child of 12, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were completely astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this, and he said that she should be given something to eat. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us for this 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time celebration. The readings are really interesting and challenging as well, so let's get right to them. When we go to that Old Testament passage from the Book of Wisdom, listen to these two lines and tell me if they don't make you a little crazy like they do me. Quote, God did not make death. God did not make death. And how about this one? For God formed man to be imperishable. We're not supposed to have death. 
was supposed to be imperishable. So, Lord, what happened? Well, what happened is that he gave us many gifts, not just human life and a beautiful world to live in, but he also gave us this amazing gift, which is up to us, called free will. We can choose to be good and live a life that is full of love and richness or not. And it is our personal choice that has introduced the whole idea of death into the world. God doesn't give us death. Now you say, well, okay, can he take it away? Well, then he'd have to take away our free will as well. And you say to yourself, well, in order to have a, a world without death, maybe it's best that we don't have free will, but think about what you're saying. No ability to decide your choices in life, your decisions in life, what path you want to follow. See, if you love somebody, we say you have to let them free. But if you love them as much as God loves them, you say the very essence of love is giving that person the, the ability to decide. And so when the first people ever created, what happens? You've got Adam and Eve saying, well, no matter what God told us, we know what we want. We're going to be wiser than him by eating from this tree. A choice they made, and maybe an even more deadly choice that fits into this particular passage. You've got two brothers, Cain and Abel. And why does jealousy enter the human heart? And why does Cain make this tragic decision to slaughter his own brother? And now we have a world with eons of history of people killing each other. This thing called death is not something God intended. He intended for us to live always and forever and to be imperishable. But again, it's a conflict for us because on the one hand, we like him to take away the bad stuff in life like death, and it is bad, no doubt about that. But at the same time, he says, but all those other beautiful things that come to you through the gift of free will is something I want you to have as well, because I love you. And when you love someone, you do give them the freedom to decide. And yet, and yet, it is a real, real problem for us, isn't it? I'd like God to take away death tomorrow and the sting of death and the pain of death and all that comes with it. But at the same time, he's saying to us, look in the mirror of your own human race and realize it's the choices you make day in and day out. You have to only to pick up any newspaper or watch any TV program and to be overwhelmed how many people every day are facing death at the hands of others. What are we thinking? If life is as precious as we say it is, if, as we hope it is, it is an imperishable gift from God, then we should be people who are instruments of God-given life. But this is a, a challenging reading, but the second is not much easier. Let's go to the second reading, St. Saint, uh, Saint Paul to the Corinthians. Though he was rich, for our sake he became poor. Jesus comes into the world. He wants to share our human journey. Journey. He shares all the things we go through, all the hardships and the pains and the sorrows and the losses. And then, interestingly enough, he experiences something that I know for some people of other religions is a hard concept to follow. How could God die? He gets on a cross for us. He experiences death. It's as if Jesus is saying, I know that the worst thing any of you face in life is not only your own death, but the death of people you love. And I'm going to share in all human experiences, including that one. I know how awful it is. I know what it is to lose people you love, and I know too what it is to give your very life in love for others. But I'm gonna do it. Now, if it just ended there where he said, I wanna share the experience of death with you as well as life, that would still be kind of sad. Happily, there's another part to the story, and it's called resurrection. Because he wants to show us two things. Yes, death is wrong. It wasn't intended by God. We were meant to be imperishable. But he has experienced what we will experience in death. And happily, joyfully, thank God, he has also given us the promise of eternal life, the promise of resurrection, the promise of life beyond this life, the promise of heaven. And that, I hope, gives you and me hope when we're either sad about the loss of people we love or facing the reality of our own demise. And then finally, let's go to the gospel. A um, couple of things in this gospel that I want to talk about, because I just think they're so good. Where, where, is my, where are my notes here? Come on. Oh, there we are. Okay. Oh, yeah, I want to focus on something that's not uh, not necessarily the, the key element of this gospel, but I just I just love it anyway. So in two parts of this gospel... We hear about an amazing moment that tells us something of Jesus' sensitivity. One, obviously, is when that woman simply touches his garment, and 
and he feels the power go out of him. He is so sensitive to this woman's hurt, to her sorrow, to her difficulty, that just the fact that she touched him and was healed because of that makes him stop. He wants to know who took the power from him. And of course, he finds the woman and he's very happy that he was able to do for her what she'd been suffering from for so many years to relieve her pain, go in peace, he says, and be well. But the other thing that I love about this story is, you know, uh, the little girl who dies. It's a small thing in the gospel, but it says so much to me. Jesus loves the little children. We always say, well, here's another example. He not only brings her back to life when she's already died, but when she gets up and she's running around like a kid will do, what's the first words out of his mouth? Not, didn't I do an amazing job today? God, I can't believe I brought her back to life. But he says, give her something to eat. There's a sensitivity about Jesus, you know, real life sensitivity, something we can all relate to, you know, that someone touches you and takes your power and you can feel it is an amazing sensitivity. And I think that says to you and me that when you and I are hurting and we may feel that no one understands and we're wondering like, will I ever have any kind of um, person out there who will get my difficulty, my challenge, you've got them. Jesus' sensitivity to all who suffer is acute and he feels what you feel he shares your journey and he's there like the woman in the story to say let me be a source of healing for you and then the beautiful story of the child just to know that that uh, you know he cares about that she's hungry like kids would be give us something to eat this wonderful humanity of Jesus is so encouraging to you and me and it reminds us that we're supposed to be emulating Jesus which is to say that we would be as sensitive to others as he is to us. How do we do that? We do that by listening better to each other, uh, being sensitive to what people are going through and reaching out to them. Try not to ignore people in pain because you know it's gonna cost you to listen to them, but rather just to be present to people, really present, whether it's a child who needs food or a woman who's been dealing with hemorrhages for 12 years, but to care, to truly care about others. Now, I want to, if I can, make a, a non-scriptural point that I found interesting recently. Um, you know, I was asked recently by a news station to come on to talk about the Pope being at the G7 meeting, which is very unusual. Pope's never gone to meet with these world leaders at the G7 meeting. And they asked me what I thought, and I said, I think it's great. You know, he's definitely breaking precedent. He gives conferences and interviews to people. But... Uh, there are things he does that I think are, haven't been done before and are good. And one of them is sitting there with world leaders and telling them what he thinks about some of these issues. So I, I thought it was on balance good. Another thing that he's done that's kind of interesting and good, but there's a lesson here, is that he's probably the pope. No, he's definitely the pope, more than any pope before him, who has had an openness to saying, let's stop demonizing gay people. Let's stop in any way uh, ex excluding them from the human family. Let's certainly not disinvite them to be parts of the church. Let's make them welcome. They are equally children of God with everyone else. That's been his whole thing. Nobody, no pope has spoken that way before. So you say, wow, this guy is very, very much a respecter of, of gay people, and that's wonderful. Okay. Then, at two meetings with two groups of Italian bishops, he let slip a derogatory term for gays. I guess because he thought it would stay in the room. And he went on to say, and you know, we don't need uh, in the seminaries any of these, and he uses a derogatory term. Now, on the face of it, you say, wait a second. On, on the public square, you say these wonderful things about gay people and their rights, and privately you use derisive terms. But here's what I'm going to say. Instead of condemning the Pope for his uh, slip of the tongue, I think it's a reminder to all of us. I think for a lot of us, we have our public face, Oh, I'm totally tolerant. Oh, no, there's not a prejudiced bone in my body. I love everybody equally. That's our, that's our mantra outside. But I think if we're really honest, in the privacy of our homes, in the privacy of our conversations with close friends and family, we let go of things about people because of their culture, their race, their religion, their, their gender, that are sometimes pretty disrespectful. And here's what I'm saying. If Pope Francis, who's a great man in many, many ways, if he lets a slip of the tongue come out on an issue he's always stood tall for, maybe it's a reminder to us that each of us needs to examine how much am I really as open and tolerant and accepting and respectful of other people as I say outside, and what do I believe at home inside me? 
And can I bring the two in alignment so that what I say I believe in the world and how tolerant I am, how accepting, is also something I live in my heart? I hope that's the lesson the Pope took away from his mistake. I guess he didn't expect somebody to tell the media, but they did. And so he issued an apology for the words that he used. And that's a good thing. But even better would be if Pope Francis and all of us could have an alignment, our private lives and our public lives, when it comes to right values. As a people of faith, let's pray together our creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now, with confidence in the goodness of God, let's offer these our prayers of petition. That the church and her leaders will continue to be a sign of faith to all people in a world faced with sadness and strife, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That as our nation observes Independence Day later this week, we may give thanks for our freedom and use it in the service of life and of God, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That our community of faith may be a living example of the mystery of God's presence among us by our love for each other, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in our parish family members who are ill may enjoy the consultation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Patricia Valdero, Paulette Swell, Peggy Follin, Josephine Romano, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Patricia Gumpert, Gerald Griffin, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intentions of this Mass, Clem Falchek, Carmela Mangione, Raymond P. Hilly, Intention of Mary Condra, Alan Bianco, Raymond Rizzi, Patricia Sonswowski, John Callahan, Richard Burke Sr., whom we remember at this Eucharist, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let me add a few intentions for those who are sick. I want to pray for my friend Diane Nagel down in the Carolinas who has undergone some special surgery and for her well-being and return to good health. Among the sick, I also pray for Jose Josena. I pray for Glenn Hudson, for Joe Falgiano, for Bertica of Seattle and her daughter as well, for Tom Slade and Kathy Bordingo, for Judge Anthony Falanga, for Eddie Mullins, and for Mary O'Brien, for Tommy Burke, my classmate and friend, for Tom and Patty Yanch, also classmates and friends, I pray for Katie O'Connor, I pray for Angelo and Al Clementi, for Leanne Lasanti, for Kimberly Cusack, for Christine Bauman. I pray for Michelle Leonhardt and Russell Castro Giovanni, for Vincent Rienza Jr., as well as uh, for Roy Citrano and Sam Maggio. I pray for Susie and Vinny Vignardi and their families. I pray for Richard Monaco. I pray as well for Herb Stadler and Judy Alaco and Larry Mayer, I pray for Richard Carbone, I pray for Janet Chevelle, Robert Talaska, Thomas Mistretta, uh, I pray as well for Michael Hellam and uh, Carmela, Catherine and Liliana, the twins who have been sick. I pray for Michael who's been battling leukemia. I pray for uh, Sandra Slater and for Anne Marie de Blasio and Linda Madrigo and Dario Rivera. And I was praying for so long for Michael Chanover, and I heard this week that he has gone to God. I pray for Carol M., uh, Carol Paolo Oshandi, for Kelly Lee Scibilia, and for Virginia Rivera. For Barbara and Ken Barsanti, 
Mary and Ken Johnson and family, Tommy Swengross. I pray for Sarah Belfi and Gus, I pray as well. Gus, you also went to God. I pray for Paulette Sewell and Terry and John Schiara and Maria and Bob Cariola. Pray for Melissa Olberg and Sal Manzo and Larry Lewis. I pray for the Parentine family and the McShay family as well and for Valio Bronzini. Pray for Jack Campbell as well as Mrs. Kalinowski and Linda and Frank Rosado. Among the sick, I pray as well for Ben Samanella, as well as George Rumi, and for Ralph as well. I want to pray, adding to the list of those who are sick, I pray too for uh, Howie Pomerantz, my friend Howie, uh, Josephine Romano. I pray for Rita Padden. I pray for uh, Richard Arturo. I pray as well for uh, Valerie Milderberger and her continued recovery. My friend Frank Savino. I pray too for Vinnie Rissuti. I just had a chance to visit Vinnie this week in the nursing home. I pray too for uh, Leanne Lasanti again. And also among the sick, let me pray for Melanie Jandovitz as well as Josephine Romano. And then I want to pray for those who have passed away. So let me mention them now. Richard Jennings, Craig Scott, Bessie and TC Center, Thomas Minter, Roland Rossi. I pray for Jenna Tuller, Margie Smith, Tessie Palmo. I pray for Phil Cordero and Frank Cazetto. I pray for Isabella Glauda, Billy and Michael Sarasoli and their father, Billy Sarasoli. I pray for Ray and Monica Carrison. Pray for Margaret O'Connor Lasanti and Bridget Clementi, especially on this, the one year anniversary of Bridget's passing. A great old friend who first made me welcome in her home along with Angelo when I was a newly ordained priest. As always, I pray for my mom, Cecilia Nicholas Lasanti. I pray for Irene and Tom Romano, for Ed June and Eddie Jandovitz, and for Beverly Maggio. I pray too for Regina Brighton, Justino Amarin. I pray for Tom Sully O'Sullivan and Alfred John Sicali. I pray for Emilio Olaco and Paul Struzzieri and Maria and Albert Cavelli, for Anna and Gary Gooms, for all the deceased members of the Vignardi family, for Diana Mestretta, as well as James and Rita Volpe. I pray for Joseph Sardone, for Gina Pelletier, for Emily Lafaso. I pray for um, Jim Bobrowski, as well as Chris Baumler. I pray for Betty Moore and Pauline Romano and Sylvia Christ, as well as Beatrice Ferrari. I pray for Millie Paradiso and Mary Rockensees, for James C. Williams, as well as Suzanne Scanio and Brian Hussey, her dad. For Annette Salintro and Judge Donald Belfi and Thomas Peter Lopresti. For Joseph Walweber and Dennis and Joe Cooney. For Richard Jennings and Jamie Scotto and Pam Amadeo, as well as Gina Pelletier, Beatrice Ferrari, Chris Baumler once again. I pray for Pauline McKenzie's parents, as well as Jeanette Chanover and Rosalie Salco, and for Gussie Sano. Let me pray for Sino. I want to pray for John, Helen, and Luke Marr. And let me add a few more names if I can to that list, if you'll bear with me and be patient with the old Monsignor. Hmm. It was just in my hands. Come on. I think you better put that on hold, folks. Okay, I got it. Among those who I'm also praying for who passed away, I want to remember Marie Tenay, a beautiful soul from our parish, much loved by many, who went home to God last night. I pray for Mary Ann and Franco Alfonso. Uh, I pray as well for Michael Manzella and for Emily Lafaso and all the members of the Emilo family, Sal, Angelo, Guy, and Gaetano. I pray too for uh, Nick Martone uh, as well as for... Um, Jonathan Diller, the police officer, now detective, who passed away recently, a victim of violence in New York City. I pray for, pray for Glenn Mankin, as well as for Dick Rosmarin, and I pray for all the people we love who pass from this life to the next. And let me add, if I can, a few intentions to those I've already read from my famous book. I want to pray among the sick, again, for Joe Falgiano and Diane Carew, and Kathy Bordengo and Anthony Falanga. And uh, I want to pray for Angela Sherman, and I want to pray too for Vinny Rissuti and Josephine Romano and my friend Diane Nagel. I want to pray for Anthony Lucich and Bill DeVito, 
want to pray for William Jurors and Howie Pomerantz and all the people who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. And among the dead, I want to remember Michael Manzella, uh, Emily LaFasso, Pat Sestar. I want to pray for Chris Baumler, Gina Pelletier, and Beatrice Ferrari. I always pray for my mom and dad. I pray for George and Joan Scaglamilia. I want to pray too for uh, Nicole Toussaint and Joe Monaco and Ralph Weithaler and Gussie Sino. I want to pray for Elaine, my dear Elaine Sedeter. I want to pray for Gussie Sino, Officer Jonathan Diller, Millie Paradiso, Suzanne Scanio, Brian Hussey. And I want to remember two police officers in particular, Michael Califano and uh, Detective Jonathan Diller. I want to pray too for all the things that are important to you, those you love who are sick. I want to pray for all those you love who have passed from this life to the next. I want to pray too for an end to all violence, the choices we make to make war in the Middle East and in Ukraine. I pray for all those souls who are being lost unnecessarily because of the decisions we make to compromise human life. I want to pray for every unborn child that they'll have the chance to be born. I want to pray too for police and firefighters and EMTs and those who keep us safe. I pray too for doctors and nurses and orderlies who try to keep us healthy. I pray too for all of our men and women in the armed forces and for their safety. I pray for an increase in vocations. We need more priests and religious very badly. And I ask you to pray for that as well. So with all these intentions in mind, let's give them over to our patroness, the Mother of God, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Lord God, through your sacraments, you give us the power of your grace. And may this Holy Eucharist help us to serve you ever more faithfully. And we ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we dwell always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise. You never cease to call us to a new and more abundant life. God of love and mercy, you're always ready to forgive. We know we are sinners, and yet you invite us to trust in your mercy. Time and time again, we broke your covenant, but you never abandon us. Instead, through your son, Jesus, you bind yourself even more closely to the human family by a bond that cannot be broken. And so in a spirit of wonder and gratitude, we join our voices with the choirs of heaven to proclaim the power of your love and to sing of our salvation in Christ.
Father, from the beginning of time, you have always tried to do what is good for us so that we might be holy as you are holy. Look with kindness on your people gathered here today and send forth the power of your spirit so that these gifts of bread and wine may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in whom we have become your sons and your daughters. When we were lost and could not find our way to you, you loved us more than ever. Jesus, your son, innocent and without sin, gave himself into our hands and was nailed to a cross. And yet before he stretched out his arms between heaven and earth in an everlasting sign of your loving covenant, he desired to celebrate the Paschal Feast in the company of his friends and disciples. And so while they were at supper, Jesus took bread. He blessed the bread and broke it. He gave it to his friends saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you when supper was ended jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine again father he thanked you for your goodness gave the chalice to his disciples and friends saying Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. We do all of this in memory of Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our lasting peace. We celebrate his death and his resurrection, and we look forward to the coming of that day when he will return to bring us all the fullness of joy. Therefore, we offer you, God, ever faithful and true, this sacrifice which restores us to your friendship. Father, look with love on those you have called to share in the one sacrifice of Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, make us all into one body and heal us of every division. Keep us always in communion of mind and heart with Francis our Pope, John our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. Keep us in communion too with those who have passed from this life to the next. We pray now that you will help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom, along uh, with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, her devoted, uh, spouse and as we pray too for a moment we think about all of our departed brothers and sisters his relatives and friends who have passed from this life to the next and we ask that god treat them tenderly in the kingdom of heaven then freed from every shadow of death we shall take our place in the new creation, and we shall give you thanks with and through Jesus Christ, who is our risen and our loving Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. You know, sensitivity isn't just something that Jesus has. It's given to every one of us to actualize in our life. In the gospel, we saw twice how what an amazing sensitivity he had to the challenges others were facing, the little girl or the woman who was hemorrhaging. But we are called on to do the same thing, to be sensitive to the hurts around us, to be sensitive to the needs around us. When we pray the Lord's, pray the Lord's Prayer today, let's pray that we might have hearts and compassion so that we don't ignore people around us, but truly feel what they feel and do what we can to relieve their pain. In that spirit, we say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share that peace with others. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. pray our spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let's see if we have any announcements today. One, just to uh, kind of give a report that so far, the casino night seems to have brought to the parish about $16,000 in profit after all the bills were paid. I hope it'll go up a little more, but the important thing is that it's a, a first time fundraiser for us and I'm very happy when as well. It was also a wonderful night. We were all together last Saturday, a couple hundred of us in the parish auditorium and, and that was wonderful too. And, and many of you have also responded to my invitation to help us keep the air conditioning on in this beautiful church. I got a wonderful letter from folks in Arizona this week saying, no one understands more than we do in Arizona the absolute importance of air conditioning and why you really need it to live. So here's some money to you, Father, so that Our Lady Lords can keep the air conditioning going. So uh, to those of you who have contributed, please thank you so much for that. And uh, we appreciate it. And to those of you who have thought about doing it, but you never got around to it, 
what time like today, right? So you just mail it to Our Lady of Lourdes in Massapequa Park. Uh, I think at the end of the program, they'll have the address on the screen, and please help us if you can. And then, uh, just to mention if I can, uh, personally speaking, this week our guest is Bob Keeler, a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who's very often covered the Catholic Church, and he is a man of true faith himself who actually attends Mass regularly and believes. Um, and then, please listen to Bob, he talks about a book he's written called Wounded Soldier, A Sacred Soldier. And next week, you'll know this guy when you see his face, is Gregory Jabara. Uh, he was, for the whole season, the whole series on Blue Bloods as the commissioner's assistant to Tom Selleck, telling him what to do, what not to do. Uh, he's also won Tony Awards on Broadway for Billy Elliot, and he's, uh, he was, I saw him in Victor Victoria on Broadway, remarkable actor, who's very devout in his faith, his Catholic faith. So Gregory Jabara is next week, Bob Keeler is this week, and as you know, what you do is, if you have Sirius XM on your radio, then you just go to channel 129, and we're on three times on, uh, on Sunday. Or you can just go to your computer, punch in YouTube, personally speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti, and watch the program. Just join us if you can. Let's get back to praying. Lord God, may this holy sacrifice and the communion that we have shared give us a share in your divine life and help us bring your love to a needful world. We ask you to grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and your families. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God.